and apologies from Right, well, um, welcome, Patrick. Very good you could join us. Um, I'm not really going to do much of an indulgence. Pat Patrick Bond is doing an update on the 10th anniversary of the right, right, um, <laughs> Belt Road. Road. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm really glad you could join us. Um, what I'm just going to ask before we start, comrades, we normally finish at six o'clock. Can I ask we carry on till quarter past if necessary, just, you know, because we have lost a bit of time. Is that all right with everybody? Hope you'll be able to stick with us as to the end. So anyway, again, welcome to Patrick. Patrick, how, would, how long would you like to speak for? And I'll give you a sort of a nudge. Well, 15 <laughs> minutes is probably a, a good amount because I want to mix a couple of things. One okay. would be the the Belt and Road and where I think uh, three parts of it are uh, emerging. One is you've already, I'm sure, begun to cover with the Namibia story. David is uh, fresh from the scene. Steve has just been there. Um, that's the, the class struggle. And there are so many ways that that plays out that we could go for hours. But the second is the accumulation process. So capital accumulation has got a stunted characteristic due to an over accumulation of capital in China. So I'll spend a couple of minutes on that. Then comes the most, um, let's say, controversial, which would be geopolitical processes associated with Belt and Road and the Western opposition and whether indeed we can call the Belt and Road some sort of, uh, quote, alternative or uh, anti-imperial potential or whether it's sub-imperial. So if I have five minutes on each of those, is that fine? So yeah, I think but... on the class and ecological struggles, now we can't ever, uh, let me say, um, uh, untie them. The dilemma is that so much of what uh, certainly on the African side of the Belt and Road, but also many of the Asian countries, the excessive debt that is, um, let's say, uh, encompassed with Belt and Road mega projects uh, in infrastructure, the most important being in uh, countries like Sri Lanka and Pakistan, in Asia, both on the verge of bankruptcy. And then uh, two countries that have gone bankrupt, Zambia, uh, although it's not necessarily just Belt and Road, but uh, Ethiopia, and they have declared bankruptcy in, in the last six months, Ethiopia just a couple of weeks ago. And what they're representing, and Kenya may well be in that same uh, category soon, and maybe even South Africa, is excessive uh, infrastructural investment that doesn't really pay off. It, it's the over accumulation of capital that I'll come to that's like the old colonial period. We could go back to the 1870s and 80s reflecting excessive capital in the world system that gets put into colonial or in this case neo-colonial projects which are major projects of um, let me call them sort of uh, the port railroad and road and bridge system that goes to uh, plantations and mines it's often very little uh, more than that some other big infrastructure projects like uh, um, uh, airports and occasional you know sports stadiums and things we can add but the class struggles i think we're going to see in two areas that are fused and there are some movements since you've just been talking about argentina i think in some ways they've been the most advanced in linking climate and especially the uh, desire for fracking and and you know the massive offshore gas fields uh, some say the the fifth largest in the world in argentina on the one hand, but also a massive fiscal crisis and a foreign debt crisis. Now, the Belt and Road doesn't necessarily always create those, but in the five countries I've mentioned, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, um, the uh, uh, African countries, particularly Ethiopia, Zambia, and I'll add South Africa, we have some interesting details. Uh, we are seeing that, let's say, combination. And we're also seeing some form of radical petty bourgeois resistance, debt for climate, mass anti-austerity protests, environmentalists up, up in arms. And the trick will be to, to pull that kind of class and social and ecological struggle together. The, the process of over-accumulation of capital is very well documented. Uh, the International Monetary Fund, for example, has said that in their studies of the heavy industries in China that in a sense are driving Belt and Road uh, overseas investments, as they put it, going out, there's over one third excess capacity. So from a classical Marxist standpoint, no surprise, it's the over accumulation that comes from uh, the particularly cheap uh, costs of uh, production, the ecological costs being passed on, relatively low uh, wage uh, labor costs and no trade unions. I would always add when thinking about China, 
something I talked to when I was in Yinqian in the north of China a few months ago, I talked to some of the, the leading bourgeois economists about, which is their uh, super exploitative hoku system, the migrant labor system, where still so many people are grounded in rural areas where their human rights are you know, maximized, and then they have very few rights in urban areas as workers. And that means this uh, going out process, the overaccumulation that leads to a spatial fix, a geographical solution is critical. And this is something that um, to me, not just my own supervisor, when I did my PhD uh, in this region, David Harvey uh, looked at, um, including in China, but also the very definition of a sub-imperial project, which is the project uh, that Hoy Mauro Marini, the Brazilian dependency theorist, described in the 60s when he was writing. And Monthly Review uh, Press has just uh, last year put out his his uh, book, The Dialectics of Dependency in English. So I encourage you to, to have a look at that. The main point about that is that if you combine these super exploitative, right, the, the cost of reproducing labor power is um, below, uh, is, is uh, in a sense, uh, above the wage that's paid, then the necessity of local capital seeking to displace its problems abroad, which I think is uh, over 10 years, the core argument. There are many Chinese Marxists who agree with me and there are many bourgeois economists. They've even got a term, um, the output gap that now measures this more and more, I wouldn't say scientifically because they don't do the labor theory of value the way we would, but they are very interested in the extent to which this overproduction, overcapacity uh, can be displaced. Now, the contradictions of a spatial fix of a geographical strategy to deal with that are now more and more explicit, which brings me to the third area, which is the geopolitical. Usually when I think about this, it's um, in contestation with our friends who sometimes are called campus, who believe that the contestations between uh, the great powers and between the emerging powers and great powers, the anti-imperial, as they may say, or uh, you know, the BRICS, the multipolar is their favorite phrase, on the one hand, and the declining Western powers on the other. And I don't think that's the right way to frame what's going on, particularly because uh, there's a broader uh, overarching approach, which I think I would I would still say is, is imperialist multilateralism. We find that in the World Trade Organization for most trade-related aspects. We find it in uh, last month's United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, where the sort of deal-making consistently protects both the historic polluters in the West and the emerging polluters. The, they're sometimes called basic, Brazil, South Africa, India, China. And then finally, um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and IMF, we could go into lots of detail on each of those. And I often will tell people, yeah, there's also another multilateral institution called FIFA. So those of you who enjoy soccer will remember that 2010, we hosted the World Cup here. 2014, it was Brazil. 2018 was Russia. So usually when I say, yeah, that's what a sub-imperial relationship is to the imperialist uh, Sepp Blatter and the FIFA bureaucracy during the 2010s, Everybody says, okay, you know, you're right, case closed. But if I do want to go back to questions of whether um, multilateralism uh, encourages the Belt and Road, um, it's a very easy case to make, particularly because Xi Jinping has long bought into uh, a Western corporate agenda of globalization of capital. He made that very explicit in 2017 in the World Economic Forum. You might remember the day that Donald Trump was inaugurated in Washington. Just before that, I think it was January 19 uh, of uh, 2017, uh, Xi Jinping was asked to, to address the World Economic Forum in Davos. He sort of picked up the baton from Barack Obama of promoting a corporate liberal globalization, and he didn't disappoint. And now there are many ways we could look at the contradictions, because in 2015 and 16, Xi Jinping had to impose very strict exchange controls because he was having stock market crashes and capital flight from the unpatriotic bourgeoisie of China was formidable. We could go on into things like the way uh, Xi has had to handle financial turmoil and the threat of cyber currencies. He's banned them or big data in the way he's, again, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, banned uh, uh, various kinds of computer gaming. So there's no question that this is a dirigiste form of corporate 
rule in which the state does have to put some some limits on especially big tech and you know big data and the, the ways in which the facebook uh, twitter uh, equivalents the wechat it's uh, uh, sometimes called the the social uh, 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 reddit system in which everything is surveilled and the state is right on top of it but i think my point about that is that this is nevertheless within a logic of uh, global corporate power. Yanis Varoufakis doesn't call this now uh, a, a techno-capitalism, but a techno-feudalism, because on the one hand, Alibaba and Tencent, the two big ones in China, and on the other, your you know, Metas and uh, your um, Google and, and Alphabets and uh, Microsofts and all the rest of them in, in the US um, are shutting out the rest of the world in everything from retail to social control to all of the high-tech industries. And I think that would be one way that we can see limits to the Belt and Road. There are dilemmas about how uh, in countries as poor as uh, Ethiopia, we should just join the BRICS or um, as uh, important geopolitically as and, and now West-leaning as Pakistan, uh, the Chinese can continue to expand. In, in the case of Ethiopia, they uh, tried for about four years to build major, uh, let's call them light industrial labor intensive sweatshops. And it raised Ethiopia's level of manufacturing to GDP from about three to 6%. Now it's back down to four. So we see again, the limits of, of the spatial fix. But crucially for geopolitics, the dilemma is whether we're going to see with the BRICS, and especially now what's called BRICS Plus, or it may well be called something else in the manifestation that, that Vladimir Putin hosts this year, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, some formulation which will allow um, this block to form more coherent and less divided relationships geopolitically. Um, the Belt and Road would be one of the two main logistical projects, the other being a potential corridor that would go um, through um, uh, Iran and up through Russia as a sort of northern corridor. Um, the dilemmas in these projects aren't only the ones that I mentioned, that once you take on infrastructure and you can't pay, you go bankrupt. And then you begin to find a degree of hostility to, to China. There's always been obviously some you know, yellow peril, xenophobia. We certainly have a, a fair bit of it in South Africa. Um, there's also a degree to which corruption plays a major role. South Africa is probably the most extreme case with our ESCOM loans from China Development Bank for corrupt coal-fired power plants, mainly through a Japanese company, Hitachi, but also through the main transport parastatal Transnet, which has locomotives that were profoundly corrupted and now have caused a major uh, fallout between the Chinese and South African states over the bills and the tax bills and whether we can get those locomotives back on the road. What I'm trying to get at, though, is that these tensions within the BRICS, the most clear, are between uh, India and China in the Himalayan mountains. There are going to be more intense confrontations as uh, the uh, South China Sea uh, disputes, maybe even Taiwan, perhaps other sites of geopolitical conflict. Kashmir has been one of the real sites of uh, multi-border China, um, uh, Pakistan, and India conflict. And as these geopolitical conflicts rise, we find two of them taking center stage, and the BRICS are in the most uncomfortable position for both of them. And I'll just conclude with these. Um, that is the uh, potential that uh, Russia will take a big chunk of Ukraine, but that there'll be um, a really, what would one say, a sort of uh, cold war or maybe occasional hot war, but a, an extreme degree of tension on that Ukraine uh, and then Donbass border. But of course, the big one at the moment is um, Israel's invasion of, of, um, of Gaza. And what we've just learned this morning is that Egypt has said we won't support South Africa's call in the uh, International Court of Justice for a genocide prosecution of Israel. That's going to happen on Thursday and Friday. And what Egypt's trying to do is locate itself, both as a BRICS member, but particularly as that site that'll be most vulnerable maybe to taking on more uh, Gazan refugees, um, to try to play some neutral role as they, they claim. Um, but the neutrality is impossible within the BRICS. We saw them try to meet about uh, the uh, um, Israeli invasion and, and genocide in November, and they just fail to come up with anything substantive. And the reason is quite interesting. What they've decided with five new BRICS members, they wanted a sixth 
Argentina, but uh, as you've already gathered, Malay is just not going to cooperate. So what they've uh, uh, really come to some, I'd say, very uneasy agreement on is that they're going to take three traditional U.S. sub-imperial powers that have favored Israel. Um, both Egypt and UAE have normalized relations, and Saudi Arabia was just on the verge of doing so. And a fourth, Ethiopia, the, the very poor but large and important African country, which has a very strong relation with Israel because of historical connectivities between uh, the um, Ethiopian uh, Jews and, and Israel on the one hand, but on the other, they have Iran. So it means this, this BRICS plus becomes as schizophrenic as any institution I've ever thought of or considered. So it really looks like that Belt and Road project of, let me go back to Xi Jinping's basic idea to, um, to conclude. Uh, the idea that by uh, integrating uh, trade, investment, and finance, there would be a um, centripetal force that would carry uh, the BRICS and particularly through the Belt and Roads into an era of mutual cooperation, understanding peace, all of the rhetoric you hear from China. Instead, the centrifugal forces that are pulling the system apart have become profound, they're overwhelming. And I think that's something that um, for critics who want to find some, um, let's say, allies in class struggles against Belt and Road, uh, extractive industries, mega infrastructure projects, problems such as uh, uh, the, the debt loads that these countries are facing on the one hand, and the ecological catastrophes that we're seeing unfolding at ever more rapid rates with um, you know, species extinction, uh, incredible amounts of, uh, of uh, the, um, I, sh I should make a little tiny footnote, but the emissions coming out of Belt and Road uh, mega projects. The, the footnote is that Xi Jinping in September 21 uh, did actually say he would uh, halt new coal-fired power plants. And those of you who know South Africa might have heard of the uh, Messina Mercado, a huge mega project, a big special economic zone, and now they can't do a coal-fired power plant. That may stop that in, in its tracks. But by and large, these double dilemmas from the class struggle and socio-ecological struggle, mixed with the accumulation problems of displacing capital accumulation uh, when there's a limit to this geographical uh, fix, the Belt and Road. And thirdly, geopolitical tensions that are out of this world and you know, multilateral systems like the UNFCCC last month in Dubai simply failing. It does make for an enormous mess and all of the hype uh, that the Belt and Road would become the 21st century vehicle for accumulation and for spreading and multipolar power and uh, for more equity and justice all looks completely farcical uh, in that context. I hope I've made that case and done it uh, tightly enough so we can spend the next uh, uh, half an hour at least uh, going through the arguments and learning from all of you. That's great. Thanks very much, Patrick. Uh, right, throw it open to debate, please. Either put your hand up or your little, yeah, your actual hand or your electronic hand if you want to speak. Uh, so I'll attempt to take people in order. You would like to go first or ask a question or anything, really? Anybody? I'm sure somebody wants to ask something. <laughs> Dave. Yeah. So, I mean, thank you, um, Patrick, for your presentation. I think in um, the United States, and this is uh, very important in relationship to the rise of China, I mean, and the decline of U.S. imperialism, is that the this... Um, anti-communist campaign in the United States, which is a uh, by uh, party, both the Democrats and Republicans support uh, a stepping up the war on China, is uh, the danger of inter inter-imperialist war and world war. And I think that uh, the struggle of that China has made to, or the, the action that China has made to buy the resources and to bribe governments all over the world, including obviously in South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe uh, is, uh, I mean, to me, it shows that they've captured uh, the state. And that is the case in Namibia, where they control all the mines, the nuclear and marble mines, they control road construction. They basically have uh, virtually taken over the country. And the the struck the uh, courts 
uh, the Supreme Court, the labor courts have all been captured uh, by these, uh, you know, by the Chinese and other capitalists. So I think it, it uh, for the working class, it raised the question um, of a fight against not just uh, U.S. and European uh, capitalism and imperialism, but uh, Chinese um, capitalist control of their economies. And I think that's a, that's a major debate because, as we all know, uh, the, the Stalinist uh, left is saying that multipolarity required that we support China in the global struggle, that China is a positive force in the development of the world economy, and, and it's a new force. And it, of course, that's under under uh, undermined by their bringing in Saudi Arabia, bringing in very, Modi, very reactionary regimes, which are attacking the working class. And these countries and in, in, in Saudi Arabia, they use slave labor and the conditions of workers. So maybe you can talk about that uh, a little bit, uh, Patrick. Okay, thanks. Should we just take everybody's contributions first, then pass Patrick? I'd like to come back and is that all right, Patrick? Come back and take them all together. Okay, thanks, Steve. Carol. Yeah, I have actually a quick question, and it's also about the Stalinists. And I, I belong to, in my union, we have an international committee. <laughs> Most of the people who make up the international committee are these Stalinists, hardened, you know, Maoists. And um, <clears throat> I sent out this advertisement, the, you know, the, the Zoom link to the people on the committee, knowing that they weren't going to come. And everybody, a number of people said, oh, yeah, we know Patrick. He's a real good guy, but he doesn't know anything about China. <clears throat> and then a lot of them argue that uh, he knows about Africa, but he doesn't know anything about China. But some of the some of the things that they were like saying were and this is just a question. So if I ever have a conversation with them about it, was that. China, unlike the United States and the West, has canceled or reduced the debts of many of these countries that they that they have had relationships with that, you know, Patrick was just talking about for big infrastructure projects and things like that. So I'm just wondering, what's the scoop on that? And not that it would matter. It wouldn't make them socialists even if they did do that or not socialist if they didn't do that but so but what what is the real story in terms of the indebtedness of the you know african and asian countries to uh, china and what have they done in terms of tr uh, attempting to collect the debt thanks carol we move on to john or dominic uh, uh, just briefly the one thing that gets me about the Belt and Road projects from, you know, the developing countries in the world <clears throat> that it's seeking to influence is, from my understanding, is that it's almost entirely Chinese technology, Chinese labour that is being used in these developing countries. It's not a development of, if you like, the developing countries there was a programme on that I was watching about Belt and Road. I forget which channel it was. It might have been Al Jazeera. But it was some country in Asia. I thought it was Thailand, but I don't think it is. And the, they were talking with this taxi driver, and he said, basically, it's done nothing for us, you know, because they brought in all their own labour. He said they even bring in their own prostitutes, you know, which, to my mind sort of signifies that far from being some sort of an internationalist project that would hope to develop, if you like, developing countries, because what we've heard, you know, in wind meetings over the last period is that particularly in Africa, the countries are used for extraction. They're not used for development, i.e. there will be mines all over Africa producing all sorts of goodies, but there's no, if you like, processing plants geared to them. And, you know, that seems to me to be one of the major flaws with the Belt and Road thing. The other one seems to be this, uh, well, I would say almost naive attitude on the Chinese part to ploughing billions of pounds into infrastructure projects only to find that the country that they're 
plowing the money into is reneging on them. And in China itself, I understand that one of the major problems at the moment is this huge uh, property company. It seems to have a very fancy English name. Is it uh, Ash Tree or something like that? That is on the edge and it has been on the edge of defaulting, you know, with literally tens of thousands of properties not being occupied because people can't get in because of the screw up that has been made there. So it seems to me that the Belt and Road process, you know, for a country with Xi Jinping who fancies himself as, if you like, a new intellectual, you know, world intellectual, it, it just seems to me that a lot of the, if you like, basics are just out the window. And it, I'll leave it at that and hope for some comments. But thanks very much for a really interesting lead off. Thanks, oh, thanks John. Um, David, I think you're next. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Patrick. Um, giving quite a broad span on the Belton Road and uh, geopolitical <coughs> perspectives. Um, you know, we need to think dialectically when we see the rise of uh, expanding Chinese capital, uh, you know, across the world. And it's really filling a vacuum which has been left by U.S. imperialism. I um, mean, it's extraordinary. Um, recently, there was a radio report on ca uh, countries in the Caribbean where, you know, the hotels and the hospitality industry was being bought up by uh, Chinese corporates. Um, and they were saying that they didn't really want to sell them um, to Chinese capital, but um, they were offering a much better deal than the Americans. And basically the point was that American corporates are not interested in that any longer. Uh, and and that uh, U.S. capital, quite apart from U.S. imperialism, is in retreat. And that's what's happening throughout um, Latin America. Uh, so that what's happening in Argentin Argentine is something of a contradiction, trying to break out of the uh, grip of uh, Chinese trade and investment. And I'm not sure whether they're going to succeed. But uh, Ecuador, for instance, is uh, firmly in the grip of uh, Chinese capital. And uh, they're mining uh, the mines there. They've owned uh, copper and uh, I think lead mines, but the copper mine uh, is already spilling out uh, poisonous uh, effluents, you know, into the Amazon uh, and causing great concern. Uh, the local company has banned uh, weekends. You work on a contract labor uh, for seven days or 360 days a week. There's no such thing as uh, a weekend. You either work or you don't work. Uh, and, uh, you know, the position of indigenous uh, people has been uh, set, had a major setback. But the Ecuadorian government is in, in a quandary and doesn't know quite what to do. Again, I think it was an American company which originally owned that copper mine, but retreated and sell, sold to a Chinese company. Uh, so it raises, uh, I'll spell out a bit more. Uh, you know, I visited Ethiopia about five years ago, and it was absolutely stunning when you go north of Addis Ababa um, to see a complete replication of the capital city uh, some 10 to 15 miles north of Addis, absolutely immaculately developed, huge signs saying thank you to the Chinese uh, investment corporations and the national state corporations, which had financed all this, um, with uh, massive uh, uh, rotors of uh, wind uh, uh, power production, you know, taking place out on the hills, uh, roads which were three lanes wide on each either side, absolutely everything immaculate, but nothing moving. <laughs> it is like a, a modern ghost city um, with uh, the beginnings were meant to be filled by, what can we say, sweatshops. And uh, I think Trump's uh, family actually had a sweatshop there uh, to do uh, Trump uh, um, trademark stuff. Um, but, it, you know, it was astonishing. So in other words, it's if you consider the power of Chinese capital, 
in a third world country, it's absolutely astonishing what you can do with ultra cheap labor. Remember that labor in, uh, mm. in Ethiopia probably is something on the order of seven or eight dollars a week, a week, not, a, not an hour. <clears throat> Uh, and they can do miracles with uh, advanced technology. There they seem to be relying more on uh, Ethiopian labor, which is something. And I'll come back to the fact that they're actually exporting labor as much as uh, uh, as capital. So in a way now, China's becoming a quite sophisticated uh, imperialist power in the sense of over uh, capital being exported. There's nothing like uh, this uh, scene in history in terms of a single country exporting this volume of, of capital internationally. And as Patrick has pointed out, it's from the ac over accumulation of capital in China itself, particularly in US dollars. So although it preaches against uh, the domination of, of the world by the US dollar, and with very good reason, in fact, it's got uh, the biggest uh, hoard of US dollars, um, apparently even greater um, than, the, than uh, you know, the US Reserve Bank, because obviously they don't need to hoard US dollars, they can just print them, so they don't need to. And so we have these massive disproportions of capital around the world, which are... Um, invading every single vacuum which exists particularly in the, in in the third world uh and uh, is 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 available uh, you know for investment um uh, just briefly on namibia i'm sure bob you'll say more but in relation to rossing uh the miners there fought a marvelous battle inspired by the struggle of the working class in south africa they signed up an agreement which is an agreement second to none in Southern Africa of union rights, of officers, of communications, of the right for um, paid uh, uh, learning, you know, tuition um, within and, and without, uh, extraordinary uh, development of workers' rights in, in Rossing uh, because of the anti-apartheid struggle and because of the workers' militancy, and as soon as the CNCC, that's the Chinese National Nuclear Corporation, uh, took over, uh, they suspended the agreement. And when, when the object workers objected to all this and fought against it, they, um, they then retrenched. They then said later, of course, they were just victimizing the workers, but later they justified it as a kind of retrenchment. When workers were re-elected uh, and fought in the same way, they then fired those workers too. Unbelievable stuff, which um, Western companies would not get away with, mainly because uh, they'd be held in one way or other to account, but Chinese um, capital operates with entire uh, um, impunity because they do not have any human rights record in, 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 in China. There are no uh, unions in China fighting for the same way. In Can fact, you stop with your remarks to close, David, if you don't mind? Yeah, in fact, yes. the conditions are something of the same order. The the struggle in Namibian workers is the same as the uh, as the Chinese workers. Um, just one last point, if I could make it. What we're seeing in in the third world now is the development of a new near colonial state, because the Chinese state works with impunity and the corporates work by putting in leading members of the ruling party and of government onto their boards. So that those boards, the entire state, which is meant to be fighting for national sovereignty, is involved in the oppression and the exploitation of their own workers and will agree to the retrenchment and to the victimization of those workers. And this brings uh, the question of, which is often raised, of national sovereignty in, in, in the third world countries, you know, immediately into the fore. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, David. So we take Ricardo and then bring Patrick back. There's a whole load of things to answer there. Are you ready, Ricardo? Hello. Hello. Um, yes, can you hear me loud and clear? We can hear you loud and clear, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I just want to say a few things. Uh, number one is that uh, even among that uh, so-called BRICS block, uh, there are a competition between those members. I mean, it's not a, a, a block that is collaborative. 
uh, among them they have uh, differences and among them they do uh, compete because uh, the you know the cap the world economy is capitalist and one of the basis of it is uh, compete and uh, and rivalry uh, and actually such a uh, uh, <laughs> competitive uh, uh, so called institution is that that they don't even have an office uh, as an organization like the <laughs> organization of African states, like the organization of uh, American states. People uh, have mentioned Argentina, and uh, you know, I, I heard David Henson making some comments that I have to respond to it because uh, uh, in, what he said about Argentina is not correct. Uh, uh, when Argentina uh, dropped from BRICS, they had to send a letter to each one of the members because uh, BRICS don't, doesn't have uh, an organizing uh, body structure. And uh, Mr. Bond can, re I can, I can see he's affirming to what I'm saying because it's true. So, uh, you know, that's how uh, these uh, so called supposedly cooperative and harmonious blocks are. They, they themselves are uh, antagonistic among themselves. Uh, they've mentioned about Argentina. Well, uh, China is not, there is uh, some economic concepts that people confuse. People confuse trade at times with direct foreign investment. And, uh, you know, there is a exploitation between those relationships, but they are not economically the same thing. In the case of Argentina, you can look and I'm quoting facts from uh, CEPAL, which is the economic agency of the United Nations. And uh, and also, I can refer, Dave, to uh, the Argentinian government economic webpage itself, that in Argentina, the largest direct investor, a foreign investor, is not China. It's actually... The European Union, uh, the combination of the European Union investments in the country and then the United States. Uh, China is a leading trade partner of Argentina, which is a different thing. And yes, there is inequality. There are disadvantages between, you know, uh, the relationship that China has in terms of trade and loan and, uh, through finance with their world countries, without a doubt. Uh, and it's still following uh, facts from the same economic uh, agency of the UN and others, World Bank, etc. In our Latin America, still the the main uh, direct investor, uh, the direct foreign investor, is the United States, followed by uh, the European Union, and then uh, China is coming. So all uh, these uh, uh, politics of the United States uh, against China is because, and, 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 and subliminally <laughs> against the European Union is because they're losing ground in Latin America, which is their backyard. Uh, so, you know, with these facts have to be addressed. People have been uh, mentioning a couple of things about the Stalinists, and I am, you know, a, a glad that they are being mentioned. And uh, let's even think that uh, for those that uh, praise China and say all these things about, you know, China is a so-called progressive uh, a country, a reformed worker state. Even in the 70s, when their hero Mao Zedong was, re was running China, China supported y UNITA in uh, Angola which was backed by the CIA. They, they, during Mao Zedong's reign, China did the United Front with the, imperial, with the American imperialists versus uh, you know, the forces that want to end apartheid and uh, want to defeat uh, South Africa's apartheid South Africa's intervention in, uh, in, in uh, Angola and, and in Namibia. The, the uh, Chinese government during Mao was the first government in the world that recognized Pinochet's junta and 
turn away Chilean activists that want to seek refuge in the Chinese embassy. So, uh, I mean, e even at their best days, according to the Stanis, China was one of the worst uh, supposedly uh, progressive countries record uh, uh, in their foreign relations with the third world itself. So China, I, I just want to end with these uh, uh, last comments uh, because I don't want to monopolize time, you know, and I know people want to uh, make their comments, but I have to say this. Even in these swift accounts that the Chinese opened with, all, with third world countries, which the, the American imperialists also, they have switch uh, accounts and, uh, and other imperialist countries do. But China is uh, recently entering in this kind of relationship. Even, even a, a couple of Latin American Marxist economists have made an analysis of uh, how these Swiss accounts uh, work. And the price, you know, probably there is a little bit uh, cheaper uh, prices with the Chinese trade, but still there is a surplus value obtained by China in these Swiss accounts, which work at the disadvantage of third world countries uh, still. So I want to leave it at that. And, uh, you know, uh, thanks for uh, this meeting. Uh, and I will, you know, intervene in another turn. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ricardo. Uh, sorry, Bob, I do apologise. I didn't spot your hand. It's a similar colour to something on your shelf behind you. Yeah, do you want to go next and then we'll return to A very to quick one then, because yeah. there's been masses and masses of uh, issues aris ar ar arising during the course of the discussion, and uh, they deserve a lot of thought themselves. Uh, I'd really just like to address a, um, a, qu a question to... Uh, to Patrick, um, it's this that it seems to me the the problem isn't workers looking towards China for uh, or, or, or the BRICS as some sort of saviour. I mean that's a problem, but it's more it's people in the workers' movement who are selling the idea that there is something uh, tangible and uh, uh, that they will do they will do better if they put their confidence. In uh, in the leadership of China and of Russia, and uh, that's the uh, that's the worrying thing, and that's the uh, the thing I think that needs a lot of thought uh, and consideration. So I very much hope to see the footnotes to Patrick's uh, presentation. You don't you don't get all the details and the granularity out in fifteen minutes, uh, but some of the questions it'd be great to see a bit more about it. Um, uh, because it's a uh, shot and shell here, I have to tell you, the uh, um, uh, the the, uh, the British Labour movement is uh, as dominated by a kind of washed out Stalinism. That by that I mean it's a uh, it's an outlook that um, thoroughly uh, uh, puts to one side any question of the working class ever seizing power. So any socialist society is really put onto one side, and the only question is whether you can persuade the uh, the capitalists to uh, to give us a bit extra to even things up a little bit, so we don't all starve. Um, and uh, that's that, that's a real problem. Um, and I think it's uh, it's where the working class is asserting itself and um, raising its head that the hopes come for turning that round. It won't all be done in argument, but it'll be done in class forces. So I was very interested, for example, in the uh, in the discussion in um, NUMSA in South Africa uh, over the uh, the big uh, bust up they had um, over the uh, the um, corruption in the leadership of NUMSA. And then um, Ermin Jim's uh, a big tirade about Mao, and uh, he's talking about his trade union should be run like a Maoist um, uh, uh, armored column somehow. You know, it's uh, that um, 
that should be something he calls democratic centralism, which means that every decision that's taken at the centre is binding upon every member. So there's there's that issue to to sort out. Um, and uh, uh, as I say, very very keen to pro to 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 take on the theoretical discussion of what's involved in the uh, um, uh, the uh, all this uh, stuff about the BRICS and the uh, and the West. Um, I'm I'm not convinced that the centripetal tendencies will uh, always predominate. I think when you get systems of alliances, they uh, they always have these centripetal tendencies. But remember, um, in 1914, uh, Britain was involved in a system of alliances that included uh, ancient enemies like France uh, and Russia. So um, it's... It, when it when push comes to shove, it's the dynamic of events themselves that count. I I, I fear, I hope to be proved wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, I'll I'll stop there. There's plenty, plenty uh, to discuss. Yeah, thanks, Bob. I think we now need to return to Patrick because mm. there's a a very great number of questions and points that he needs to respond to. So, Andrew, I know you've got your hand up, but I'll bring you in when we return back to the discussion. Okay, go on, Patrick. Yes, and I'm so flattered and excited to be in this discussion with so many great people, and we can go as long as you as you have energy. Maybe I should just take <laughs> this last one that Bob has thrown out because we worry about this all the time. Not only that the largest trade union, as you say, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, has a very strongly pro-BRICS, but also pro-Putin and pro-coal position that's been about two years in the making, but there are seeds that go back to 2016. And many would say, well, that's uh, corresponding with when a new funder came in and had a big influence named Roy Singham, and I think Steve Zalser and I've had a had a long discussion on his show about that. You can you can reference, but it's not just that, Bob. It's the Congress of South African Trade Unions, Kasatu, one point four million members. Again, it's a matter of their leadership, and we had a debate about that in September. And on on the uh, little uh, side note to Pam, I've sent she can maybe uh, send it to you if you'd like the um, presentation I made to try to persuade Kasatu that instead of a class snuggle with the BRICS, they should try a class struggle. And of course, that wasn't successful because the terrain of the BRICS trade union forum, for, forum which met in Durban in uh, in September, was one in which they're part and parcel of this myth-making about uh, a multipolar alternative. Um, and then we also have the Communist Party. We have the uh, left alternative to the African National Congress called Economic Freedom Fighters. Uh, Dave and others maybe who know better might predict that... Uh, well, maybe the EFF will get 15, 18% of the vote mm -hmm. in the election that happens in May or June this year um, and may go into an alliance with the, the rump of the African National Congress that's still somewhat, uh, let's say, left in its rhetoric, uh, the radical economic transformation faction, whatever's left of that, perhaps a new president, Paul Mashatile. So what you're saying, Bob, when you look at South Africa is absolutely the correct warning that if we don't get some stronger political analysis of a geopolitical terrain that uh, can be very confusing for members of these unions when their leadership, Numsa, Kasatu especially. We do have very strong leadership from the overarching um, uh, uh, Union Federation, SAFTU, the South African Federation of Trade Unions. So I'd point to Zwellenzi Mavavi, and probably the toughest small union in that federation is GAWUSA, the General Industrial uh, and Workers Union of South Africa. And you'll find on YouTube dozens of statements by a very eloquent uh, president of, of that union, Mametwe Sabe. Then to Ricardo, exactly uh, in agreement with uh, with you that BRICS is incoherent, doesn't have an office, doesn't have any rationale for choosing the next BRICS plus members, right? The five Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa for 15 years have met annually. They haven't done anything except a BRICS bank, which I'll make a long argument if you'd like about how useless it's been. Uh, contingent reserve arrangement alternative to the IMF never appeared an attempt to do um, vaccine interventions during COVID, which fell apart completely when Bolsonaro from Brazil went one way and the Russians with Sputnik and the Chinese with their Sinopharm and Sinovac had their own interests. So when President Ramaphosa 
Prime Minister Modi tried to get the vaccines off of patent in the WTO. They couldn't even move as a unified bloc. They can't move in WTO, in the World Bank, in the uh, IMF, in any coherent way. And now that they've got these new members, Saudi Arabia, Iran, you know, UAE, Egypt, Ethiopia, and then the next round, which we'll see in October when uh, Vladimir Putin hosts the BRICS, will have probably another five or 10 new members, but again, with no no coherence. I think probably, Ricardo, you would agree that the reason Argentina was put there was because Lula da Silva in August was very desperate because um, Malay had already won the first sort of round of the election and he wanted to have a little offering to the Argentine people. Don't vote for him. You'll go further if you uh, keep the status quo and now you can join BRICS and it didn't work. Now, the point you're ar arguing that um, there's, let's call it an antagonistic collaboration. That's what, um, let's, let's recall Hoy Maro Marini, trying to say that sub-imperialism can be full of contradictions. You can have rogue sub-imperialists. Maybe Vladimir Putin is one when he invades Crimea in 2014 or Ukraine in 2022. But I think we'd see, and David sort of hints at this in his questions and points, um, de-dollarization is where the rubber should have hit the road here in Johannesburg in August. Do you remember all the hype that the dollar is toast, that we're going to see the crash of um, US uh, quantitative easing capacity, that the um, deregulatory fervor of uh, the US Fed um, or the excessive tightening of interest rates uh, in 2022-23. All of these problems that the whole world has with US dollar hegemony, the trade function of the dollar as a sort of numeraire, a measure of value and a measure of, uh, of uh, let's say, liquidity. All of these have to be challenged. I, th I don't think anyone would reasonably disagree with that point, but they couldn't do it. If all rhetoric, and even with Russia being thrown out of SWIFT, really needing to have some alternative, they couldn't manage anything. And the right-wing forces within the BRICS, which are the finance ministries and the central banks, simply blocked any discussion of de-dollarization. So Ricardo's basic point, incoherence, chaos. Um, I would go back to, to you, Bob, and say the centrifugal tearing apart of forces in the world economy fully overwhelms any centripetal fantasies that the BRICS can hang together. And Joe, when you were talking of Evergrande, uh, the financial... Oh, but by the way, David's point on Ecuador is of critical importance because it is the site where I think we've got the greatest resistance. It's not just the point of production or, to be precise, extraction. The Chinese oil company that did a deal with Rafael Correa in 2013 to drill probably the most pristine place in the Amazon, the Yasuni Park, seemed to be the single greatest biodiverse hotspot in the world. I've spent a week there and working with Axion Ecologica uh, for keeping the oil in the soil, keeping fossil fuels underground. And when Korea in 2013 did a deal with the Chinese, so the Ecuadorian state company started to drill, it was a catastrophe. And this big movement that had built up with tens of thousands of protesters in Quito fell apart, but then they somehow revived. Um, the Yasunidos, the people supporting Yasuni, a new generation, they won a referendum in August, even though they lost an election where a right winger took over. There was a referendum to say, no, no, don't drill. So that's going to be one of the great tests, David. I'm sure you're going to watch that, as we all do. Those comrades in Ecuador are often really world cutting edge on ecofeminism and indigenous politics and combining it with class struggle. Um, and David, because you know Zimbabwe so well, David was kicked out of Zimbabwe. I think uh, he made the mistake of listening to rhetoric of Robert Mugabe about a socialist Zimbabwe and he organized for socialism and he got himself in jail and fired and thrown out, but uh, more power to you for that experience. Certainly when I saw in Zimbabwe last year, for a couple of weeks, a tour around some of the um, mines, a gold mine near Mutare, the greatest diamond field in uh, probably in history, even bigger than Kimberley, in a place called um, Chiadzwa, Marange, or the lithium, the biggest lithium deposit in Africa in Bikita, or a huge new iron ore and steel plant, which is in um, uh, Chivu. Those four places that I spent with the Center for Natural Resource Governance, some time wandering through and trying to figure out what is the accumulation process? What is the extraction? What's going to be fed back? All the points that you've been making, David and Joe as well, about that poisonous character of extractivism was 
absolutely crystal clear. And I think the other point Joe makes about financialization, where the middle class had very few opportunities for accumulation, so they bought that second flat and they made the ghost cities boom. But now with Evergrande and now some of the others going under, it does look like that Chinese capitalist property market, like so many, like the US in 2000. Six, seven, eight, nine, you know, just crashing on the middle class. So, a devalorization of overaccumulation, bringing me to some of the people that Carol was hoping I could name. Because you're right, Carol, I, I've been to China quite a few times, including uh, in August this year for, for a week in, uh, in uh, Yinxian with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And I do hang out with my friends there in the World Association of Political Economy. So let me throw some links to uh, people that I really trust. Uh, most of all, probably Ao Long Yu, who was in Hong Kong. And uh, I've put on the link Borderless Hong Kong, his network, before having to go into exile. And he comes from Fourth International. And there's a couple of books that uh, uh, Pluto's put out, very, very useful. Then I would add Ho Fong Hong, who's an independent left intellectual from Johns Hopkins, superb work. And I've put a, a link to some of his ideas. And um, another um, Chinese Marxist who's who's based in, in China called Xin Shang. And he has a couple of major pieces that describe and uh, empirically prove all of the overaccumulation. And then we've got um, more, let me say, neo Maoists, Wen Tejun and the uh, Recon rural reconstruction movement. There's a, um, a network in the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences of Marxists around Cheng and Fu and Alan Ding. Um, and then when I was there, I even had a chance to debate the main uh, bourgeois economist, Justin Lin, who used to be the World Bank chief economist. So I, I do my best, you can tell your, your comrades from the campus side, uh, to keep up with what lines of argument are. Finally, to uh, Steve, I mean, all the points you make, full agreement. And the one that uh, hangs over us all, which we cannot predict at this stage, because we don't know if Donald Trump will come back in and, and fire up his anti-Chinese rhetoric. But, you know, on the, on the other hand, what, what Joe Biden did was maintain in place all those uh, all those restrictions and tighten many of them on, um, on uh, you know, some of the um, strategic minerals and uh, uh, microchips and all the rest. So we, we lost uh, just a week uh, ago, uh, John Pilger. He died age 84. I'm sure all, all of you have seen his films. And he played a really great role here in uh, South Africa. I can you know probably put it on counterpunch my obituary in the next day or two. But please go and have a look at the film, The Coming War on China. It's at johnpilger.com videos. And you'll find all his, his work there in his South Africa apartheid did not die, the Palestine film, Absolutely terrific. Now, we might have our differences now and again. John, at one point, uh, was seen to be a sadist and even pro-Putin, although I think the balance of you know information is that he you know, basically viewed the world not only through geopolitical, but through local class struggle perspectives the way I think all of you do. But I do think that is the, the central problem for uh, global capital, to, to know whether they've got China inside the tent, the way Barack Obama had uh, described it when he was asked by The Economist magazine, the central question of our time. The Economist said to, to Barack Obama, do you have China inside the tent or outside? And for, for Obama, and I think this sticks still today, even though there are all these tensions, for Obama, it was a simple matter that China is basically a global capitalist power with major state-owned capital operating in a global context with value chains, with competition that makes them obey the law of value. Of course, he wouldn't say it like this, but that having China in on the multilateral institutions, giving them much more voting power in the IMF in 2015, for example, uh, giving them much more scope to um, have senior positions in these multilateral institutions, that has been the strategy. And I don't see that ultimately changing, notwithstanding the minerals, uh, the, the, the military industrial complex, um, you know, beefing up the, the tensions in different places. What, where I would have expected the, the West to do much more was here in Africa. And I must say, in the one place where we're probably in the hottest war uh, in our Southern Africa region, David, you can you can uh, confirm or deny, but it's Mozambique, where the third largest methane gas field in the world is in uh, the northern part of the country offshore, uh, Cabo Delgado province. And there we find um, a deal, not only Total Energies, uh, you know, with mercenaries, even the Wagner Group was coming to their assistance before they lost too many of their fighters to the Islamic rebels, but also ExxonMobil is opening up in the next few months. And guess who their partner is? China 
National Petroleum Corporation. When Total is in Uganda, it's working that huge uh, oil extraction under Lake Albert and a, the biggest, the longest pipeline, a heated pipeline in the world to a port in Tanzania using China National Overseas Petroleum Corporation. So these are sites where the interpenetration of capitals remain quite formidable. And I would be surprised if even someone as maniacal as Trump would let this get into the kind of war I think we all fear. But uh, Steve, if you're asking, does this represent inter-imperial rivalry? It may well. At the moment, it looks to me like imperial West with the multilaterals, with its corporates, with its neoliberal policy, has incorporated, with a few exceptions, important ones, Ramaphosa in uh, the International Court of Justice this week, Ramaphosa in the WTO on uh, vaccines, uh, Putin uh, moving into Ukraine, rogue, but nevertheless, uh, imperial uh, politics and imperial economics especially, still can count on sub-imperial allies. And the greatest proof of that was last month, where we desperately needed to do something global capitalist class needed to do something on the climate and instead nothing because of a very strong alliance between the BRICS, BRICS plus, UAE, the host, Saudi Arabia especially, and the big historic polluters um, with, um, let's say, a, an agenda simply to not cut emissions, to not cut fossil fuel use, and certainly to never admit that they have an ecological debt. So those would be my main points. But if Andres wants to, to keep them going, um, love to hear where we want to go from here. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Um, Andros, you had your hand up before, so do you, would you like to go first, please? Hi, comrades. Hi, I'm just we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, did you say Pam? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I think we are very lucky to have a, a comrade who is an expert on China. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we will need his expertise uh, again and again in the next period. Uh, because China is such a big issue today, and I mean everything related to China. Uh, China, BRICS, Chinese economy, Chinese social situation, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and these issues divide the left. Or let's call it the radical left, because the, you know, the traditional reformist parties are now uh, basically following the line of the bourgeois uh, ruling classes, uh, and there are sections. I mean, in the in the in the in the main Western countries around uh, the U.S., the let's say the Western Alliance or the West, the dominant feeling is of course pro-West uh, and against China and Russia essentially because they are considered to be undemocratic, um, authoritarian, dictatorial, and of course, because of the war in Ukraine. But in the rest of the planet, uh, semi-developed and underdeveloped economies, this is not the picture. Uh, it's, it's correct to say that there are at least big sections of the population, and even within the ruling classes, um, where um, this, this is not the dominant feeling. Um, because what counts there more, I think, is the role of Western imperialism uh, and the role of Western colonialism over the past centuries. Uh, in, and in these countries, there are big sections of the left which provide support, conditional or even unconditional support to China and Russia because it's anti-West. Uh, and then there are sections in, in the West, of course, in the left, that they support uh, and take, for example, the USFI, the, the main Trotskyist international organization, which supports um, um, supports the West uh, on the issue of Ukraine, um, uh, and, and other groups like that, uh, quite sizable actually, which say that the problem is not an interimperialist struggle, it's a struggle, um, uh, it's by, by a poor neo-colonial country, Ukraine, against the big imperialist country. So this, this debate is going on and it's going to continue. Um, and therefore, I think it's very important to take position on all of these issues. I believe the, the central position is the character of Chinese, the Chinese state uh, and Chinese expansionism. I think it was described by uh, a number of comrades before. 
um, it's imperialism. It's imperialism in every sense, um, and um, and and therefore uh, it would be wrong for Marxists to support one imperialism, Chinese imperialism, and their allies uh, against another imperialism, the Western imperialism, on the basis that the Western imperialism is the strongest and most as dominant at this stage in the planet. Uh, this is a question which is going on, for example, in Greece. Um, uh, to a lesser extent in, in, in developed industrial countries, I'm sure, but to a greater extent, perhaps, in underdeveloped countries in in Africa, China, uh, Africa, Asia, and, uh, and, and Latin America. And, and then there are many contradictions in the Chinese economy, in the Chinese society, in BRICS, and in the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Yes, and growth rates in China are falling. And the West is making a big issue of this thing, saying, okay, we won the game. Um, they are no longer such a big threat, etc." But I think this is not the case. Um, I think the problems faced by Western economies are much more serious, much bigger uh, than the ones faced by Chinese economy at this stage, without, under without underestimating the problems uh, in the Chinese economy, the bubbles that are bursting like the, the real estate bubble, um, etc. And of course, BRICS is not a coherent formation. It's not something solid, it's not stable compared to the G7 or the alliance between the US and Europe. But what we see now is that BRICS is holding and it's expanding. And I think that this is the dominant feature in the next period, be be precisely because of the Western uh, imperialist centers, both on the economic and on the ge geopolitical level, they are losing ground. And this allowing China to, um, to, to the bigger extent, but also Russia as a secondary uh, power to intervene and gain space. It, I think it's important to note the speed of developments. I am very impressed, I have to say it. Um, I think it was uh, David who said that uh, there is no precedent to this kind of expansion, as we see by the Chinese state. Uh, BRICS was uh, built 15 years ago and is expanding fast um, with, um, I mean, many countries interested, six countries, five, leave Argentina out. Uh, the, the, the Indian uh, foreign minister said six more are joining in uh, in 2024, and supposedly there are tens there knocking the door, etc. So we see an expansion. It's not a solid um, formation, but it's expanding, and this expansion is undermining um, West the, the the U.S. and the West ability to check the planet, as used to be the case, let's say, 20 years ago, and be the policeman uh, policeman uh, of the planet. The second thing is Belt and Road. It's, it's got a history of 10 years, uh, 10 years plus, a few months, created in, in 2013. Uh, the, uh, based on Chinese capital, it's now expanding in projects of in 152 countries and uh, at a total uh, value of 3.3 trillion dollars. Uh, uh, and there are estimates that say that by the end of this decade, the total uh, amount of capital spent on Belt and Road Initiative projects could be up to 10 trillion. Now, this is something that the West cannot do at this stage. The, the, the China has huge reserves, as we all know, and this is the base for this expansion. It doesn't mean that everything will work, and it doesn't mean that all that the projects will be profitable, and it doesn't mean that many of the loans will be paid back. But I think the example of Sri Lanka, it's about the port in Sri Lanka, I don't remember the name, which the Sri Lankese government couldn't pay back. And they handed over ownership to China for a period of 100 years. So this kind of deals, which uh, allows flexibility in, in China's expansion, which does not have, the IMF, for example, doesn't have it. It will impose austere pol policies which cause reaction. Um, 
in the masses. I'm sorry, I'm thinking too long, so I have to cut short. Um, the other aspect is the, is, the, is, is the trade war against China and the tech war. It doesn't work. I think the recent uh, developments uh, with, I don't know how many comrades follow this, uh, um, new developments around Huawei, which was nearly crushed by uh, by by the Trump and by uh, Biden's administration in 2020, which was able to develop extremely highly developed technology in mobile phones, uh, etc., um, is 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 uh, something that took the West by, by it was a huge surprise. And then it's BYD, which has now overtaken Tesla, um, and China is expanding into uh, the the biggest export uh, country in cars, even more than. Japan. Th these rates are really amazing, the, the pace at which this is taking place. And therefore, I, I think that um, the effort of the West to uh, br put brakes um, on, on China will cannot work. Not because China is in any progress, it's a very reactionary state, of course. But on the economic front, I think that the West is not in a position to uh, stop uh, Chinese uh, growth. Having said that, we need to take a clear position against, in my opinion, against both imperialisms, whether it's U.S. imperialism and European imperialism, whether it's Chinese and Russian imperialism, and take a position for, you know, our the class we belong to, the working class, socialist, revolutionary ideas and perspectives. Thank you, comrades. Thanks very much, Andros. Does anybody want to speak who hasn't spoken already or ask any quick questions or anything? No? Okay, so we've got two hands up at the moment. Time is pressing, so if we could ask, uh, I'll bring Ricardo in first, followed by Steve. I could ask you to keep you, you know, your remarks as concise as possible. So we've got plenty of time for Patrick to sum up the discussion, please. So, Ricardo, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yes. Uh, a, a couple of things. Number one is uh, if we speak of uh, one, uh, as for example, the, this discussion uh, mainly was about China and their uh, BRICS. But certainly, if you mentioned that you have to also compare, you know, uh, its relationship in the world economy to other powers as its influence. So, because as for example, I'm from Latin America, in Latin America, uh, as a, a region of the world, uh, you know, dominated by uh, foreign uh, imperialist powers, there is always the discussion and uh, the promotion of our own elites, you know, peri bourgeois and, and the bourgeoisie that is allied with imperialist uh, uh, capitalist classes. It's about somebody, some other power influencing or coming here to uh, this place or, you know, uh, coming over here to uh, spread communism. So, uh, or, you know, whatever uh, truth or not truth in that uh, uh, involves. So certainly, you know, mentioning, uh, discussing China, we have to talk about U.S. imperialism, about the European Union imperialism, and, you know, China, Russia, and whatever other powers exist uh, on the planet. I just want to uh, mention, I don't know if any of you uh, write, uh, I'm sorry, any of you uh, read uh, Spanish, but there is an interesting interview that happened three days ago uh, with the Chinese ambassador in Argentina that... Uh, he says that he's comfortable working with me. <laughs> I'm sorry, comrades, uh, but for me laughing. But I mean, people that I think that China is such a progressive thing, you know, uh, it shows it through colors. And he says, he's in the journal um, Rebellion. If you speak Spanish, you can look at that. Uh, and also he's been asked about the war in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, he has to, he would have the opportunity to denounce the U.S. and, uh, you know, the invasion and everything. And he just says that China is for peace, you, whatever that means, you know, it's completely ridiculous and ludicrous. So uh, uh, 
you know, uh, we are facing in the world, and this will be my last two uh, sentences, uh, still the threat and the menace and the exploitation of the classic uh, imperialist powers, the European Union, uh, you know, with its contradictions, uh, United States, uh, you know, the capitalist uh, crap pot, uh, sub imperial or peripheral uh, state of Russia, uh, China, Japan. And uh, in the third world, those powers align with the local bourgeoisie. And, uh, you know, it's uh, still the challenge of unity of the international working class and uh, the independent organization of uh, workers. In Argentina, it's a, a challenge, uh, and it's one of the few places in the world that exists an independent working class movement called the FITU, the United Front of Workers, which is a, a United Front of uh, four Marxist organizations that with all their defects and you know uh, shortcomings, they are waving a great battle and they are not affiliated with any uh, capitalist uh, tendency. And uh, you know, in my case, I give them critical support. Ricardo, think, could you uh, some, could you join remarks to close, please? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, uh, and you know, that's uh, practically uh, what I was going to say that uh, critical support to the faith. If I see you in Argentina, a uh, victory for the workers of the world. Thanks very much, Ricardo. Uh, right, we're just going to take Steve and then uh, if Steve, if you could be very brief, then we could give Patrick the lion's share of the remaining time to, to, to sum up and just respond then to any further points. So, would you like to go ahead, Steve? Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, first of all, we have to recognize that uh, the opening up of China. Uh, to U.S. investment, imperial, uh, imperialist investment, was a savior for world capitalism. Uh, China has helped out to extend the life of, of capitalism internationally by allowing massive investment of surplus value into China. Uh, and I think that, uh, I mean, today the decline of U.S. imperialism, which is absolutely critical to understand, uh, is going to lead, in my view, to... Uh, more, more pressures for an inter, for a war. I mean, historically, imperialism has only got out of its economic decline and economic crisis by war, uh, by destruction and fascism. And I think that's what's on the agenda internationally. And the rise of Trump and Malay and forces like that on a global level is a, is a direct result of the crisis of imperialism and the decline of, of U.S. capitalism. So the, I think what is critical in this regard is the development in the working class in China, because it is the largest working class in the world, and it's under extreme pressure. Uh, Stalinist uh, top-down uh, you know, attacks, repression, uh, any independent kind of working class movement in China. So I think maybe uh, uh, Comrade Patrick can talk about any evidence of the Chinese working class, uh, where that is, because I think we can't talk about what's going on globally in the world working class without looking at what's going on in China. China, Ch Chinese working class has the power uh, to transform the global world. And uh, last, I would say that um, U.S. imperialism is in deep, deep crisis. And uh, the, the possibility, possible probability, I don't know, of, of, of Trump coming to power uh, in this epoch, uh, Trump wants to make a deal with the Chinese. You know, in other words, he's a pragmatic uh, uh, reflection of the decline of U.S. capitalism. He says, we can't fight everyone, let's make a deal. And I think that that struggle inside the American capitalist class uh, is, is a, key, a key aspect of how uh, the decline of American imperialism is reflected in uh, the internal, the, the world situation. Um, and I think that, that we have to look at that. And, and at last, I mean, obviously, the U.S. working class is in motion, and the growing class struggle in the United States, the growing class consciousness is a, a very hopeful political development for the world working class. And I think that's going to grow uh, as, as more and more workers become political, and the development in the United States against Zionism in the working class is very important. So anyway, I, I see some optimism, but the, the frank 
reality is that we're going in towards world war and we're going towards the rise of, of fascism internationally. Right. Thank you for that, uh, Steve. Do, should we return to you now, Patrick, just for just for some more responses, just to uh, sum it up, please. Thank you. Yes. Wow. Again, terrific inputs from everyone. I find it hard to uh, disagree because you're all very persuasive, but maybe I'll try. Um, I see this just slightly differently, Steve, in a way that reminds me of a debate that um, Lenin had in, in his 1916 book, uh, Imperialism, a pamphlet, where he also felt the inter-imperial rivalries were core to the way the, the process was unfolding. And I contrast that with the big tome written three years earlier by Rosa Luxemburg. For her, the durability of imperialism wasn't necessarily just the internecine battle of capitalists with their states, with their colonial hinterland, but it was something more profound. It was the capitalist versus the non-capitalist. It was the way imperialism was a vehicle for overaccumulated capital that burst out periodically in crises that compelled a, a globalization process. She was very eloquent in, I think it was chapter 27 of the accumulation of capital in describing exactly the push that we see everywhere. My own supervisor, David Harvey, renamed this accumulation by dispossession. And what I've always seen, at least in the 40 years or so I've been connecting into various struggles around the world, is that that process has been just as powerful as what you're worried about. I mean, I'm sure you're absolutely justified. And when David said, look, there hasn't been anything as serious as Chinese expansion into uh, the world, a capitalist uh, overaccumulation moving into Africa, it does remind of a period where there was an equivalent ratio of overaccumulated capital that found its way into Africa, 1870s, 80s, 90s, and hence the big Berlin meeting and the way uh, the city of London and Paris stock markets and all really mobilized capital to support a major uh, colonial push. The point, though, and this is where Andros and I might have a wonderful disagreements about the extent to which there are limits to that accumulation, limits to the extent to which the port you're mentioning, Hambantota in Sri Lanka, could pay its way. Well, it couldn't, and it was the subject of a foreclosure. Plenty of mineral streams. Actually, I think it was Carol who was asking, didn't, didn't China do a little bit more than the West, yes, uh, to relieve debt? But don't forget that the Chinese debt was uh, in uh, more, let's say, recent terms, a much bigger share than it had been 15 or 20 years ago at the at the trough of the pet of the debt crisis. And the interest rates are much higher on Chinese debt. So I'm not going to give uh, Chinese leadership credit on uh, debt relief because it really keeps the debt for repaying the next uh, time and the, the, the payments they've already made an enormous amount on. That's why when I was in China last and talking to Justin Lin, it was pretty evident that their worries are about the ability of capital to continue accumulation by dispossession. They wouldn't stand for discussion of getting rid of the hoku system, that apartheid style migrant labor system where the women do social reproduction. So the labor is super cheap in the coastal cities. And, and Justin Lin kept worrying quite publicly about China's labor productivity crisis, the rates of, of increase in productivity um, compared to somewhat rising wages there, unsatisfactory to the capitalists. So I do think, Andres, there's notwithstanding all of the great points you're making, quite explicit limits emerging to the way capital can accumulate, can expand without pushing its crises elsewhere. And that means that when Ricardo, to conclude here, was thinking about what are the true colors of China, desperate to make deals with Malay. And, you know, Bolsonaro was just as desperate when he took power, right, in 2019. Do you remember his soy producers who export to China um, who were major contributors to his presidential campaign in 2018, made him do a, a, a similar U-turn on the way they dealt with China. And I uh, add to that something extraordinary that happened last week. Sergei Lavrov, the Russian uh, foreign minister, was discussing the uh, genocidal attack of Israel. And he said, actually, what Israel's doing in Gaza is nearly identical, his two words, translated from Russian, I think it was an RT interview, 
nearly identical to what Russia was doing in Ukraine, denazification. So there are some extraordinary, uh, let's say, um, unpredictable, fluid contingencies going on. And Steve may well be right that we're looking at this period in which the limits to capital accumulation lead first to overaccumulation and hence the need to destroy economic deadwood the way World War I and World War II did, the way depressions do. Um, or the Luxembourgist line may be more accurate, namely that what we're really going to see is not imperial rivalry with this sub-imperial block, but continuing assimilation, which will be the destruction of the planet and more and more people as those systems of accumulation by dispossession, by extraction, kick in. And that's what I see all of us needing to do and what I think David and Steve were doing in Namibia, beginning to link workers at the point of production in the uh, Rossing mine with the environmentalists, with the communities, with the women. And I hope that's the, the Marxist politics, uh, the Luxembourgist politics that links all the issues where people are fighting accumulation by dispossession that we can all unite on. But if not, we'll keep the debate going because you dear comrades are, are the most sophisticated I've run into all year. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me. Well, thanks very much, Patrick. I think you've led an extremely interesting and useful discussion. Um, I have just posted on the uh, web page that we will be posting this meeting. I, I, I need to check, actually, uh, Patrick, um, can I post this on publicly? Is it OK? You've not mentioned any names that matter. No. OK. No, and, and in fact, my own, I think my own freedom, David knows it because he never had this freedom. <laughs> my own freedom is irrelevant. So poor David uh, tries again and again to to uh, work <laughs> socialism in this place and finds it harder and harder, but uh, he's okay. always been more relevant than me. That's the problem. <laughs> All right. So that uh, we'll post this meeting on our YouTube channel after the meeting. Please do look at this again, everybody. You can make comments and stuff. It would be quite good to have a debate, actually, uh, on the YouTube channel. So please do have a, a look at that. Can so, Patrick also post the links that he mentioned initially? Yeah. I'm going to post them, Carol. They'll, they'll be put up with the, the video, so I'm, I'm, I'll share all the information we've been given, OK? OK. So uh, that's that's great. Thanks thanks again, Patrick. Thanks, for everybody, for all your excellent contributions. So so next week we're meeting again. I'm going to bring Roger in because Roger is, uh, is sorting out next week's meeting. Uh, yes, first of all, comrades, thank you to... Patrick and to everybody who participated for what I think was absolutely a brilliant uh, exploration of what is quite a complex um, issue. Uh, I thought the discussion was uh, was really uh, excellent. Next week, um, we have two comrades from Sri Lanka uh, who are speaking about the lessons of last year's Argalaya, in other words, national uprising and perspectives for Sri Lanka. The two comrades are uh, Darusha, who is a uh, very uh, prominent left economist, uh, and and also the other comrade is um, Swastika, who is a, um, a, a leading um, is a trade union activist, trade union uh, leader of a, an independent uh, federation. Uh, a Tamil woman, and uh, they're both speaking on on the on on this very uh, on a on a development which I think has has got rich lessons for all of us around the world. Um, right, that's it. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, Roger. So that same time next week. Uh, I'm sure this will be a very another very valuable discussion. And uh, with that, I'll say good evening and declare the meeting closed. And see you soon. Thanks for very comradely chairing. Yeah, great. And that's David, okay. That's well, very nice to have now. you along. Yeah. Good morning, uh, everybody. Aware to power to the people. Thanks, comrades. <laughs> Bye, comrades. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>